this and we are going to get going okay step two here there we go so can everybody see the screen okay I'm going to assume the silence means yes, and we're going to get going. So today we are going to dive into chapters four and five. We should get through these pretty easily. Um, I like there's a little more conversation um, in this one. Uh, however, um, I, I don't think we'll have an issue getting through these two chapters. They're pretty short and pretty straightforward. If we have time at the end of the, the lesson, um, we do have a short excursus on just the general um, structure of the book of Revelation, which is incredibly important for reading it and understanding it. Um, and so if we have time, we'll do that. If not, we'll just save it for next week. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, but it's one of my favorite things to talk about in the book, besides Jesus, but the structure is right up there. So let's get going. Chapter four. A little recap, um, if, in case you missed it, or I know a week has gone by, so sometimes it's just easy to forget stuff. So Jesus has delivered uh, a message to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We call them the seven churches of Revelation. And these seven churches, while specific historical, geographic locations and communities, really have a message that speaks to the church throughout every age. Um, and it's about what it looks like to overcome. And it's about the temptations that the people of God face on earth, you know, throughout every era. Um, in Ephesus, we were reminded that overcoming uh, means not allowing our hearts to grow cold um, and not forgetting to love one another. We can have all the right doctrine in the world, but if we don't learn to love one another, we're not looking like God or Jesus. Uh, in Smyrna, we were uh, instructed to overcome through being faithful despite physical persecution and danger. Sometimes that's what overcoming um, entails, is just that willingness to, to physically suffer. Pergamum, overcoming, um, involved uh, compromise and accommodation with cultural norms and cultural expectations. Um, being that holy people that's set apart and that's different from this world is kind of a theme that God's people in really from the Old Testament forward have struggled with. Um, but it's been the consistent theme of what it means to belong to God is just to be different. Thyatira, uh, we were... Um, given this picture of, of overcoming as resisting cultural compromise. This time it came in the form of potentially of economic stability um, and making those compromises in order to maintain, you know, livable wage and to get jobs and so on. Sardis uh, was really just overcome complacency, wake up. Um, it was a church that had kind of rested on its laurels and had become a church that wasn't really doing what a church is called to do. And then finally, Phil or not finally, Philadelphia. Um, really, nothing bad to say about the Church of Philadelphia. They were killing it. Uh, however, they were also being persecuted and potentially killed. And so, overcoming just was being faithful again, despite the the potential of physical harm. And then finally, Laodicea was this call to overcome cultural conformity. And this time, it, it came in the form of um, self sufficiency and this reliance on wealth and very um, temporal forms of security um, that evaporate rather quickly, but can delude us into thinking that we really are doing great, we're fine. Um, so after Jesus finishes these, it's like immediately, uh, we dive into chapter four today and we get a vision of heaven. So that's what we're gonna jump into right now. Verse one. After I looked, or after this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. So the first image that we get is this open door. Um, what, what is the phrase today? What is the phrase, my door is always open, mean? Um, it means that you're um, welcoming people at any time. Welcome. Hospitality. It, it's an open invitation. Uh, so if there's a door standing open in heaven, what, what might that mean or what that might, might that insinuate? Well, 
we're going to see something in heaven. We're going to see something, but it's it's an invitation too. Like God wants us to see this. He wants John to see this. John's not bombarding his way in. He's not forcing his way through the gates. This is something that he is invited and intended to see. And by that extension, something he's intended to share. Now, what he sees is, well, I guess we'll get there in a minute. So the invitation is issued by this loud voice. Uh, soon John is in the spirit. And that's a phrase that we've heard before. Uh, and he sees the throne room of God. So we're not real sure what it means to be in the spirit. It's never really explained. However, when we look at how Paul uses that phrase, one day I was in the spirit, um, John, at the beginning of the letter, said I was in the spirit. Now he says I'm in the spirit. Usually that is accompanied by some sort of vision, um, well, being, being caught up in some sort of blissful state, um, you know, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We, we don't know, but that phrase is used, and usually when it's used, it is accompanied by some sort of vision like this. What must take place after this is what John is going to receive. That's what he's going to be told. Um, and likely that refers to the period of persecution that these churches were facing at that time. So remember, this is a historical letter written to seven churches in a situation. And so after this, here's some things that are going to take place. Now, after this is kind of like the word soon that we talked about in chapter one. We're not real sure how long after this, in that first century situation, all of this will play out and, and you know unfold and so on. Um, so it could be a short time, you know, maybe second century. It could be, um, you know, we're standing on top of the mountain peaks and we're looking over, and after this might be ten thousand years. We don't we don't know, but sometime after this there's going to be this vision or these things are going to begin to unfold. And that may not sound very helpful to us um, who aren't currently in that situation. But remember that these are seven churches who are struggling in different ways. Um, some of them are struggling in a very um, immediate way with safety and with scarcity and with um, rejection. And they're in a very difficult point of hardship right now. And so maybe this message that after this I mean, kind of insinuates this difficulty will pass, that there is something better coming. You know, it may not be immediate, but there is something after this. That, that would be a reassuring message. Other churches are struggling in, a, in a, a, they're still struggling immediately. It's just less apparent to them uh, to things like compromise and self-sufficiency and so on. To them, this message may not be one of comfort. Um, Jesus does provide warnings in here, and what comes after this may be a reminder that while you, you know, do what you got to do right now, or doing what you think you got to do right now to survive, there is something that comes after this, and it may be judgment, the kind of things that Jesus spoke about. So there may be a, a dual meaning of, of what we're about to see here, depending on the situation of the people. Um, does that make sense? Okay, I can only see five of you at a time, and you're shaking your heads yes, so I'm going to move on and assume it does. <laughs> all right so chapter four verse three and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian a rainbow and when we okay a rainbow resembling an emerald so we don't need to imagine like a rainbow as we would think of it as seven colors streaking across the sky it says it looks like an emerald so it's really just in the word is just a bow of light so this green arc kind of uh, encircled the throne Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and these are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So we have a lot of descriptors um, of this heavenly throne room and what it looks like. Um, and so we're going to kind of, we're kind of going to break those down, but not terribly specifically. We'll talk about why in a second. So the image of John is shown in the spirit. Uh, he says is a vision. He was given this vision and he uses phrases, what looked like a lot. And those are important words. Um, you know, visions in scripture are usually kind of mysterious or otherworldly in nature. 
Um, and they may sound, I mean, it may be that we are so familiar with these things. Let me make sure nobody's trying to get into the study. All right. Is my audio okay for you guys? Yes. Okay. Sorry, if you're having problems with the audio, you might want to check in on your end. Um, okay. So, um, so the, these visions, we may be accustomed to it because if, I mean, if you read the Bible a lot, they show up with such frequency that maybe the language doesn't seem weird anymore, as, as odd as that sounds. Maybe we're used to hearing about throne rooms with heavenly creatures and so on because we've just read it a bunch. But if we weren't real familiar with the Bible and we came to it and we would read one of these visions, it would just seem like the most bizarre thing in the world because there's like creatures with six wings and they're covered in eyes and there's this red guy on a throne surrounded by a green bow of light and it's just really weird. These visions are supposed to be otherworldly. Uh, and so we wanna be really cautious by taking really literal stances when it comes to a vision because even John isn't being literal. You know, when he uses phrases like it appeared as or it looks to be, he's making a comparison in his mind. What he's seeing, he's trying to put into words, and the only thing he knows how to express this as is, is basically a metaphor. Um, if, for instance, um, you know, the person on the throne looked like Jasper and Carnelian. Well, he probably didn't look like he was made out of like polished gems or something, but in John's mind, it's like, okay, this is, this, those are red-hued gems. The, this is a red hue. This is kind of what it looks like. It's kind of this brilliant thing, and to John, that's the that's the concept he has available to express what he sees. And so he uses the, these, these languages and these terms and these images. So again, when we come to visions, we just want to tread lightly. We don't want to say this is exactly how it is or what it's going to be or what it's going to look like because even John can't do that. So John has this vision of the throne room um, and really it's it's not original. It's not saying like John just ripped it out of these books. I mean, heaven is heaven. It looks the same, but John is definitely borrowing language that he's familiar with in order to describe these things. If we were to read um, Ezekiel chapter one and two or Daniel chapter seven, uh, what we would read would be very similar descriptions of this heavenly throne room. So if we were to go back and read those Old Testament books, we would read about heavenly creatures. We would read about um, one sitting on the throne. We'd read about blazing fires, you know, and so John is, is familiar with this. He's Jewish. He grew up Jewish, you know, hearing these descriptions and these visions. That's the concept he has to express these things. And what he sees is very much in line with these Old Testament visions. Um, you know, maybe there's something to be said there, too, about the consistency of God and how he manifests himself to people. If it's, if it's the same then and now, and, and we could probably dive a lot deeper into that, but for now let's just try to take this in because this is a really fun image and a powerful image um, so the details of this description like we said really we're going to break them down a little bit just so that we can understand like a mental picture of what he's describing but they probably don't carry significance beyond the larger scene and by that what i mean is we probably don't need to look at each detail and say this represents this or this represents that or this means this Sometimes Revelation does that, but other times it's, it's really just about the bigger picture or the bigger scene that's being painted here. And this is likely one of those situations. Um, again, it, it'll be a little clearer by the time we finish these two chapters, but Jesus just moved immediately from this conversation to these seven churches telling them, I know your successes, and I know your failures, and here's what I've promised you. So he makes all of these very authoritative statements, and immediately we move to this throne room scene. So we have all this trouble and this junk unfolding on earth, but then we get up to heaven, and maybe there's a very different message and picture of things and how it's unfolding up there. Um, if that's not super clear right now what I mean by that, it, it will be by the time we're done. Uh, but yeah, so, so really the big scene and the big picture is likely what we're meant to, to it's meant to impress itself upon us here. Uh, so with that said, let's, let's look at these a little bit and just kind of paint a mental picture for ourselves. Like we said, Jasper and Carnelian, these were precious stones. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, they have kind of a red hue to them. Um, I'm not super familiar with them myself. It's not like ruby red, but it is kind of this kind of red. Hue. Fiery. What's that? Fiery. 
of a fiery picture. Yeah, that's probably, honestly, good. Probably why he chose those. Uh, 24 elders surrounding the throne. Um, 24, again, is, is a significant number because 12 is a significant number. Um, if you think of the Old Testament, we had 12 tribes of Israel. We think of Jesus. There were 12 apostles upon which the, the church was built. Um, so that 24 might represent the totality of God's people, old and new. Um, but we've got these 24 elders. They might just be the 24 um, original tribal leaders and 12 apostles. I don't know. Um, but there's some significance there that represents God's people around the throne. Um, and that's even further, you know, by what they're wearing. We said that wardrobe matters in, in Revelation. As we read throughout this book, almost every time God's people are pictured, they're usually wearing white robes. Um, crowns are mentioned in a couple of different instances, but the white robes are really the giveaway that this is the people of God. So it says that there was, you know, loud flash or loud, loud flashes. There was flashes of lightning and loud crashes of thunder. What? What feelings would that produce? A little fear, a little awe, or a lot of fear and awe. <laughs> Some mixture of different levels of fear and awe. Yeah, there's, it's like when you stand outside in a thunderstorm, there's part of it that's awesome and that you want to, well, maybe a better example is how, you know, we're, I'm, I'm from the redneck part of Illinois, how we stand outside and watch tornadoes. So, <laughs> you know, it, there's part of it, you know, that this is, this should be terrifying and you really should hide and run away. But there's also part of it. It's like, this is awesome. I just want to stay and watch. Um, it's kind of that mixture of fear and trembling and awe and wonder. Uh, we've already had this image of the seven spirits of God. Um, seven spirits, again, like we said, likely is seven is a number of completeness or fullness. Um, the, the full presence of God's spirit is there before the throne. And so when we, we look at this image starting to come together, we, we're also told that there's this sea of glass in front of the throne. Um, and that's kind of a weird image that we might imagine in different ways, but you, it doesn't say this necessarily like a huge ocean or anything. It just says that there's probably this section of um, water that surrounds the throne that separates the throne from the 24 elders, but it's, it's so calm and so still that it looks like glass. What emotional response would you have to something like that? Let's say we're out at Citizens Lake and the water is just smooth completely. Serene. Serene. Mm -hmm. Calm. I would say peace. Yeah. We've yeah, there's. Kind of, before. It's there's peaceful. Yeah, I mean, and, and probably the peace is really the emphasis here because there's, there's this really odd juxtaposition of awesomely terrifying thunder and lightning and at the same time there is this water that's completely still and calm and serene um, it's a mixture of emotions um, here's just an artist rendition of what we read we'll look at several different um, artist renditions of just different descriptions and scenes in this book not necessarily because they're great artwork um, but sometimes people are just visual learners, um, and it's just easier to maybe see a picture of, of things. And so here's one picture. We'll look at another one a little later. Um, you can see in the center a throne, someone shining with kind of that fiery hue and that bow of green light and the seven lamps and that separation, 24 elders. And so, you know, this is just kind of a, I don't know when this picture was made. I'm going to guess it's probably the late 70s or 80s. Um, maybe the early 90s but anyway it you know just maybe a visual description for those who um, have a hard time visually um, picturing things uh, before we move on any questions about anything yes yeah yes julie i cannot hear you is your microphone on She's muted. What are the seven spirits of God? Yeah. Um, so in Revelation, um, numbers oftentimes have a symbolic value. 
Um, 12 is um, the number of God's people. You know, there were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 apostles. Um, before uh, Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan River, they had 12 stones that they set up in representation. So 12 is, is a number that is almost always symbolic or associated with God's people. Seven is another one of those numbers that's very symbolic. Um, it's a number uh, that seems to be correlated to represent completion or fullness in some way. Um, there were seven days of creation, and on the seventh day, God rested. It was very good. Um, when Peter asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody? Jesus says, or Peter asks, should I forgive them seven times, thinking that's a that's complete and full forgiveness. And Jesus says, not seven, but 70 times seven. So seven is this number that in, in Jewish thought is associated with fullness or completeness. So the fact that there are seven lambs representing the seven spirits of God probably is not saying that there are seven distinct, you know, individual spirits of God, but is probably more likely this way of saying that there is this, the full presence of God's spirit is there. Does that make sense? Thank oh. you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes. I've heard people relate that to Isaiah 11, where it has the description, the, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. It has like a whole bunch of yeah. descriptions, 11, 2, and 3. 1 through 2. Yeah. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Sevenfold plenitude in, of his power in one spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't Who know. was that? Who was that talking? I can't see. Hey, Jane. Jane. Hi, Jane. Julie. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, I think. Yeah. Okay. I got six. Your wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, fear. Because everything that's mentioned in Revelation is somewhere else. It's it's all a perfect circle. Yeah, usually. I don't know. That could be a reference. I mean, I don't see any problem with that. It's all those qualities are expressed and are found in the Holy Spirit of God. So, sure. <laughs> Anything else? All right, let's move on to the second half of verse six then. All right, in the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings, which sounds kind of uncomfortable. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So we have a description of, and this isn't the clearest picture, I apologize, it's the best one I could find. Um, a, kind of a literal depiction of four living creatures um, you want is, and you can kind of see the animal representations there. They got all these wings. Um, they've got all these eyes all over them. They just look like really, really weird things. They even have eyes in their armpits and wing pits and things like that. So again, maybe these are literal beings up there in heaven. I don't know. Maybe they represent something. Their visions. Um, there's a. There's certainly a picture. This picture is certainly very striking. Um, there's definitely a an emotive response that they kind of invoke. So let's talk about these creatures a little bit. Um, these four living creatures are, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure what it means by living creatures exactly. I mean, they're not dead creatures. But God's throne is oftentimes described as containing heavenly beings like this. Um, and you can see some references there, Ezekiel 1, uh, Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel 11. Um, and, and oftentimes they have very similar descriptions of the lion and the ox and the eagle and the man. Sometimes it's a leopard, I think. Um, and it, six wings and eyes everywhere and all these things. They're very similar descriptions. So again, John is certainly 
not to say this isn't what he's seeing, but he's certainly borrowing languages familiar from the Old Testament to understand what he's seeing here. Um, so these living creatures seem to function as emissaries of God. Um, we're going to see in chapter 6, um, I think it's, yeah, 6 and 7-ish, um, they really are, are kind of involved in dispensing God's judgment with the seals and so on. Um, and so they, they have this function where they serve God like that. They're not just kind of hanging around looking all cool, um, but they do have a job. So what does it imply that they're covered with eyes? Um, that is an odd quality, but it, it is significant, perhaps. What do eyes do? They can see everywhere, all directions. Yeah, so there's, there's nothing that really escapes their sight or their gaze. Um, and that probably, we should, I mean, there's a, there's a literal picture there, but we should understand that as kind of, um, kind of in a metaphorical sense too, you know, it, it's not just things in heaven that they see, but they're all things. There's nothing that really escapes their notice. They're kind of all seeing beings. So what message might this picture of these all seeing beings that are going to be dispensers of God's judgment, what message might that, that send to these seven churches? Let's talk about those who uh, are being persecuted. Um, I, that seems comforting to me because God sees the whole picture. Nothing, nothing the bad guys are doing is hidden. He can see everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th there's definitely this assurance here that, you know, wickedness isn't going to go on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, here are these dispensers of God's judgment who see all things. So there is some comfort to be had there. Mm -hmm. um, what about the churches to whom Jesus had warnings? What message might this send? That he sees what they've been doing. Yeah. Uh, failure to overcome is not going to go unseen. Um, Jesus had these warnings and he says to the overcomers, you know, to, to those who overcome or to him who overcomes, I'll give this, 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 and this, or these rewards. And that certainly is a comfort to those who are, are facing hardships, but also he threatens at one point, I think it's Ephesus, I'll remove your lampstand. I'll take your church away. Um, you know, th there are judgments too. And sometimes we can, as people get so caught up in living in the immediate that we can, I don't think anybody would say, yeah, I, I get away with it and God can't see what I do. But at the same time, we might live that way at times. Um, there's definitely a, well, there's some, there's a challenge to overcome and keeping one eye on things to come, I guess. So a little more about these creatures. Um, it's debated what, if any, significance really their appearance has as far as what animals um, are there. Uh, it could be that in this culture and in this time, these were seen as kind of the most regal of creatures in God's creation. Uh, lions certainly are used in that imagery a lot. They're used as, as powerful, regal creatures. Eagles, in the same way, there's a lot of majesty in that. Um, <laughs> oxen or always or bull whichever one you want to translate it as they're always symbols of power and strength um and then people i mean people are used for a lot of different images you know we might think if we're in this vein we've got these three other really regal significant creatures people are kind of the crown jewel of god's creation uh, made it in his image and so it, it could just be that these are you know of all the things that exist in the living world these are of evoke the most majesty, I guess, which would be appropriate if they're surrounding God's throne. Uh, and these four regal creatures never stop worshiping and declaring praise. Uh, and their song, very familiar, comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. It's another throne room scene in which the Lord is praised continually by heavenly creatures with the same song. So again, we're, we're revisiting some Old Testament passages and visions here. Um, 
you know, A, because it's familiar language to the people, but also it kind of reminds that this God that was active way back in the days of Isaiah is still the God that is active today and still will continue to fulfill his promises just as he did back then, which to struggling churches is a very important, important message. All right, so let's talk about the song they sing a little bit. Um, this is, this may be one of the most significant things we talk about today. Um, it has to do with one of the, um, the literary tools and qualities of this book that's used um, here a little bit, but mainly later on when we start to get into the scenes of the beast and the harlot and the city, uh, Babylon and those things. So parody. Parody is um, a literary technique um, and it can be a performance technique too, but it will say rhetorical. That's probably a better use of it. It's a rhetorical technique um, that's used to, to make a point through comparison. Um, sometimes it can be comedic. You know, you might think of Saturday Night Live or Monty Python's Flying Circus or, you know, those people that um, will kind of poke fun at current events or poke fun at well-known things by uh, dressing up like a person and sounding like a person and reenacting um, a certain event in a particular way, but there's always a, a twist on it in some way. That comparison is a parody. And like we said, sometimes we're probably most familiar with that as a, a humorous technique. That's not the only way that parody can be used, though. Um, sometimes uh, parody can be used as a way of critiquing something um, or um, emphasizing inferiority of something. Um, it, al almost, it's, it's different from satire, but it's almost in a satirical way. Um, a good example of this is the song that these living creatures sing in chapter 4, verse 8, and what is spoken of the beast in chapter 17, verse 8. So here, the creatures sing, God was and is and is to come. What, what does that mean? What does that refer to? What does it mean that God was? That he doesn't change. Okay, there's an unchanging nature about him, certainly. Eternal. He, he's, he's eternal, yeah. So God was, he always has been. He presently is, so he's, he's continued, he's still active, still powerful, and is to come. What's that referring to? In our future. He's always in our future. Yeah, so, I mean, Jesus in particular will be a, a manifestation of God that is to come. But altogether, these, this God was and is and is to come does refer to his, um, his eternality. Um, perhaps it might be even referencing his authority in some ways. He was authoritative then, he is authoritative now, he will be authoritative um, in the future. Um, and so there is this consistency uh, of God's authority and power and strength and so on in this song. That's what's being praised. When we get to chapter 17, verse 8, let's just pull that up before I get ahead of myself. Where did all my oh, stinkers sort of my stuff go? There we go. All right. So if we read chapter 17, verse 8, it says, The beast which you saw, so this is an angel describing it, once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. So we have a slightly different description of the beast, and yet it kind of uses similar language in some ways. He once was, but now is not. What might that, that mean? If I were to say that the Hardee's that was located on uh, North Main Street once was, but now is not, what would that, how would that describe it? No longer present. Yeah, there used to be a Hardee's there, but it's not there anymore. So, Failed. what's that? Failed. Failed. <laughs> Failed. Uh, yeah, in some way, it's, it's, it's temporary. It is not eternal. It's not consistent. It's not fully powerful or fully... Um, authoritative. So this beast once was, now is not, but will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. 
So it's saying there will, there will be a time when it comes back to. There's a comparison being made here with this similar language. God, on the one hand, is powerful, eternal, consistent, unchanging, unconquerable. This beast has had ups and downs and wavers and comes and goes and so on. And yet, when we look at the scene when the beast comes out of the water, people praise the beast and say, who is like the beast? When in chapter 5, we're going to hear who is like the lamb. You, you kind of see the comparisons that are being made here between God and his sphere and his realm and Satan and his sphere and his realm. We've got a lamb that looks as though it was slain, uh, but is alive. Later, we're going to have a beast that looks as though it was wounded, but was healed. Um, and there's, there's comparisons here. But in these comparisons, every one of them kind of points out the inferiority of Satan and his agents and his influence and his sphere. And that's really the goal of parody in this book. Um, and we, I got ahead of myself and did a lot of these things. We, we will cover this a lot more when we get to the beast and to the harlot and the city of Babylon and things like that, because that's when this really comes um, center stage and is most apparent. But a lot of the groundwork is going to be starting to be laid here. So I just wanted to kind of be on our radar as we're going. Getting some more text messages. Okay, my audio. Um, I don't have um, another audio device. Um, I only have one uh, available and nothing else is plugged in. Um, you may want to check if you have audio coming from two different sources on your device. That would be a recommendation. Um, okay, so parity. This was being introduced here. Um, probably questions ab about that. Any questions or clarifications I can make um, before we move on? Okay, again, it's not a comedic kind of parody. It's a compare contrast kind of parody. All right, verse nine. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Um, so pretty common um, in this, it's, it's not, well, I guess we kind of see instances of this. Um, but in this ancient time period, it was really common for vassal kingdoms, uh, which would be kings that were under the umbrella of authority of a, a greater king. It was really common for them to come and to um, pay homage to the emperor or to the king. Um, they would lay down their crowns as a sign of respect and subservience and submission. Um, an example, an ancient example of this would be um, um, in Assyria. If you remember um, in 2 Kings, I think it's King Josiah, um, and I don't remember the Assyrian king's name, Sal, 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 starts with a Sal, Sal Hash Hasbar, something like that. Sennacherib, that's what it was. Um, so King Sennacherib of Assyria is by far the strongest military force in the ancient world at that time. And he's just conquering kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. And um, he comes to Josiah, who is a vassal of Assyria at that time, or is trying to avoid being, no, he is a vassal at that time. And it was common for a King Josiah, even though he was king of Israel, and he sat on the throne of Israel and, or, or Judah and was authoritative, he still had to pay homage and he had to pay taxes and he had to pay reverence to Sennacherib of Assyria because he was kind of the overall monarch of the region. Um, you know, we might, there's not really a great comparison today, honestly, because we don't have monarchies and empires and things. Um, oh, but th this happens at the, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. That's good, yeah. Even though they're just kind of ornamental titles at this point, that's that's a fair comparison today. You know, you got the queen, and then you've got your um, your I don't know how it breaks down. Mary, you're you're better at this. You explain. It. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, 
during Queen Elizabeth's coronation, all of the um, some members of the House of Lords, so like the Duke of Edinburgh, um, the Duke of Gloucester, um, all, all of these um, heads, no, noble or uh, heads of noble ho houses, had to um, come before the Queen and pay homage to her, and that meant take, they had crowns that they wore, and they took them off and they swore fealty to the Queen, um, and then like had to touch her crown and kiss her on the cheek, and then they would depart, and then another Duke would come up, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. that. And that's a great picture of kind of what's being described here. You know, we have these 24 elders, and yet they're, they're servants in full submission to the one on the throne. They're just laying their crowns down. So what might that symbolize? We, we were talking about that. Uh, subjugation, humility, honor, praise, reverence, um, all of those things. Like somebody with ADHD. You just constantly. What's that? Yeah, you heard you. Okay, uh, so the word used for crown here, um, again, this is not the diadem, the victor, the, the ruling crown. This is um, a victor's crown, that olive wreath that we um, talked about last week. Um, and so they're taking off these olive wreath kind of crowns, laying them down at the feet of God. So maybe what kind of a message is, does that send? He, he already has all authority, um, but the fact that they're laying the symbol of their victory down. Giving him the credit. Yeah, I mean, it, essentially, that, that's what this is. This is, he, he, he is the one who is victorious. We just get to be beneficiaries of it. Um, you know, it's our reward, but we, the same way with the cross, it's Jesus' righteousness. We just get to, we're given that as a gift, not because we've earned it or because it's ours. Same way with this victory over, you know, um, persecution and hardship and Satan and, and the enemy and so on. Like, this is God's victory. And really, this is a good point to talk about Revelation as kind of a battle book. This, this, is, this is warfare that's happening in this book. Now, it's not traditional warfare where there's like, you know, armies clashing and swords and shields and steel, you know, clashing and, and so on really the warfare that's taking place is through the means of worship. Um, and that is an interesting way to think about worship as spiritual warfare in a way. Um, we just heard a song from the living creatures, you know, about God and, and his eternality and his power. We're going to hear more songs before we're done today. There are other songs that are sang in this book though, saying songs that are sung in praise of the beasts, songs that are sung in praise of the harlot and Babylon, songs of worship, essentially. They use worship language and talk about the greatness and the victory and the, the power and you know the blessing that comes from following um, Babylon. Um, when Babylon falls later on in, I don't remember the chapter, I think it's 17, um, oh, the song of woe that comes from the peoples of the earth. Gone is her beauty and her grandeur and her, you know, oh, poor us, all of our, our means to wealth and security are gone. There are songs all the way throughout this book, songs of praise and worship and song. And, and, and the songs that we sing talk, really describe which side of the battle we've aligned ourselves with. And it really is a battle for worship. Worship is really just the outpouring of allegiance and faith and trust of our hearts and minds. So when you think about it, worship is the ultimate method of warfare in this spiritual stage. Um, and so, you know, when we lift up our hands and we sing on Sunday morning, we're not just singing songs and we're not just praising. I mean, we are praising God, but we're, we're inviting heaven into earth in some ways. And we are proclaiming truth in a world that sings songs of deceit. Um, our worship matters in far more significant ways than just we're going to sing some songs and I like the beat and it's kind of cool or it makes me feel like uh, I'm back at home at church with my grandma or something. Those, we do have those emotional connections, but those are really the most shallow of purposes for worship. Um, it's battle, mm -hmm. which is really just a different way to think about it. We don't talk about a lot. So we have this scene of worship and praise and just this outpouring of honor again here's a, an artist rendition of what we're talking about again maybe not the greatest um 
you know, depiction or greatest form of artwork. Maybe you love it, maybe you don't. Art's totally subjective. Uh, but just for those visual people, we've got our 24 elders surrounding the throne, bowing down, laying down their wreaths. We've got four crazy creatures <laughs> surrounding the throne. What's interesting about this one, um, we talked about the seven lamps of God. We have here a menorah, which is probably what John is kind of thinking of. A menorah would have been what was in the temple, those kinds of lamps. Um, and so that's a, an interesting feature there. Um, but we've just got this really otherworldly scene um, that we're given access to. And again, it has details that we, we want to understand, but not because each of them has significance in and of themselves, but because each of their details speaks to the larger scene and the larger picture of what John is, is being allowed to witness. So let's put this together. I said the main, okay, we, we said that. Let's contribute to the larger picture. So what impression does this image of heaven leave us with? Let's, let's just God see. is the center. He's the one being worshipped. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's definitely one of the, the things you're supposed to walk away with. Angel opens up a door, says, come in, I want to show you something, and this is what you see. And you, you hear the thunder, and you feel the, the reverberations in your chest, and you see the sea of glass. What? Just emotionally, how do you react to that? Just knowing he's in control, always. The power. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, so it's kind of like when I look out and see the sunset or the sunrise every morning or every night, just the, the majesty you see in that, yes. you know, that's what we can see, how much greater it's going to be then. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Yeah. yeah, the awesome, the power of God. So, excuse me, I'm sorry. So let's think about the seven churches that this message is given to, because we can have a reaction to that. But these people, the immediate audience, were in a particular situation, some of them very comfortable, some of them not comfortable at all. How might they have reacted to this, given their situation? Why might Jesus choose to show them this very surreal image, um, given the world that they lived in at the time, what they're going through? That's, that's not a good question. Let me rephrase that. So let's say that you're living in Philadelphia, um, and you're being tossed out of the synagogue and told that your whole faith that you've built your life on is meaningless and that you've got it wrong. And as a result, you're also starting to experience some legal and, and physical persecution as well. And then J Jesus shows you this image of heaven um, that we just saw. Um, what, what might that, what message might that impress upon you or what significance might that have for you? Hope. Definitely, there's a hopeful. Mm -hmm. Definitely, stay strong to be to be an overcomer. Mm -hmm. There's some encouragement here. Hopefully, that not that stay where you're at. Mm -hmm. So you might say that even though God seems challenged on Earth, um, not just in Philadelphia, but in um, I don't remember the second church, Smyrna. Um, mm -hmm. The one where Antipas, I believe, was killed. Um, we already had somebody that's been martyred because of this. You know, you have these, these situations in which it seems like God is on the ropes because, you know, the synagogue's not really listening. Rome's not really listening. Um, you know, we still have these cults and these idolatrous temples and these temper, temples to the emperor that are just in full swing and really are making it hard for us to live. And yet... When we look at heaven and we look at where God's at, he's not pacing around the throne room sweating it because he's worried. He still sits and nothing has changed. It's the same scene we got in Isaiah. It's the same scene we got in Ezekiel and that we got in Daniel. Nothing has changed in heaven, even though things on earth seem sketchy. Um, maybe another bit of encouragement. You know, earthly kingdoms like Rome 
often attempted to look powerful and regal. Uh, and oftentimes that would be accomplished through lavish decor or uh, amassing great fortune or through um, really subjugating people and having this, this appearance of strength and power through making people do humiliating or ridiculous things or making other leaders, vassal kings come in and lay down and kiss their feet and so on. You know, earthly, still today, earthly kingdoms try to look really strong. I think of, uh, think of China and North Korea and their militaries and how they march in uniform and, and have phenomenal marching shows um, because they look really strong. Where you might think back to World War II and Nazi Germany, Hitler's troops did the same thing. It's this impressive display of power. God's throne room puts all these to shame. You know, we have earthly kings that really want to look like there's something, and yet we have a king on the throne whose throne room is is awe-inspiring and breathtaking. And maybe that's a reminder that while earthly kings can seem imposing, we do have a true king that is even more amazing. Uh, and maybe this impresses upon these these churches the importance of overcoming. Uh, Don, I think you mentioned that a little bit. God is king, and he is judge, and he sees all. Our living creatures are reminders of that. You know, even though it may be difficult or hard, it's not called overcoming because things are easy. It's not called just slightly, you know, step over a difficulty. It's called overcoming. <laughs> kind of has this, this mental picture of leaping over, climbing over a huge wall. Um, it's not, it's not easy, but it's worth it. So a little bit of application here. Um, this, this imagery and this scene is it's very foreign to us in some ways, but it still makes this impression of grandeur and power probably less so on us than it did in ancient audiences, but it's still pretty impressive to us. Um, but as a reminder, we're not really meant to be impressed with the throne room, as awesome as that is. We're really meant to be focused on the one on the throne. And I know that can, you know, can almost get lost because so much time and, and space is spent describing the throne room and how it surrounds God and what it looks like. But really all of it testifies about him. The living creatures, the seven spirits of God, the sea of glass, the thunder and lightning, the 24, all of that says something about the one on the throne. He's the focal point. So why might we need this reminder of God's greatness from time to time? Um, you know, we talked about the situations of the seven churches. Um, in some ways, we look like them. In some ways, we don't. Um, but in, wh why would this message be important to us today as we finish up this chapter? Well, everything is about what's going to happen in the future. I mean, our our short little time here on Earth is just the beginning of our real lives. So everything is about what's what's going to happen when we get to be with God all the time. Yeah, we, we have an after this as well. Yes. Um, and, and maybe it's immediately, maybe, I, I don't know how that works. It's, it's out of my pay grade. But, you know, after this, whatever that means, this is, this is just as significant to us as it was those ancient people. I just finished watching two different versions of movies based on the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. And the whole thing is so encouraging. I mean, the whole goal is the celestial city. It's not, this world is full of, of great and wonderful things, but this isn't it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that this is, and, you know, we can find ourselves in situations like these seven churches where we are discouraged, where we might feel like God is against the ropes in some way, or we may feel, you know, we may feel that our government is, you know, putting on these huge displays of strength and power and grandeur, and they may be discouragements to, you know, to our faith in some way, but we, we can look to this picture and other pictures like this throughout scripture and be reminded that even though we may feel a certain way right now. That's not reflective of ultimate reality. And even though we may feel like our faith is 
we may feel like uh, Elijah, um, you know, when he flees from the mountaintop and God, I'm, I'm the only prophet left. Nobody else is faithful. Oh, everybody's gone. Woe is me. And God basically says, just shut up. <laughs> like, you know, there's, there are those moments where we might feel like that. And we can look to this picture and be reminded, look, God's not sweating what's happening right now. This is, this is heaven. This is still calm. There's still thunder and lightning. There's still peace on the sea of glass. There's still one on the throne. And he still sees everything. This is going to be fine. Um, so that same encouragement is available to us today. All right. Any, any closing questions on chapter four before we move into chapter five? This one will go... I think it'll go a lot faster than chapter four. It should, but you never know. Okay, let's get into chapter five then. Let me go ahead and get to my... There we go. All right. So let's talk about Jesus. Uh, <laughs> chapter five, verse one. Then I saw... So again, we have this vision of heaven. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So probably our first question is what is this scroll? Um, that's kind of the focal point of this scene and really of the next few chapters. So who does this scroll belong to? Well, it sits to the one sitting on the throne, God the Father. It's his possession, it's his belonging. And what is uh, the, the purpose of a seal in this ancient world? Um, seals, you know, they were the wax seals that we might think of. Um, seals were the result of you would melt wax and then you'd pour it on a document, you know, and it would harden there. And then you would use something, sometimes it was a signet ring, sometimes it was just like a little stamp, but it would be your official stamp. It basically was kind of your signature. Um, and if you were wealthy enough, if you had one of these, these signatures, then you were of importance or significance or you had wealth um, because not everybody could afford this stuff. Um, and you could not read a document without breaking the seal. Um, so that was the purpose. It was, A, it was to seal it up. It's in the name. But also it was to just give authority to something. Like it's like my name is on this. My mark is on this. Um, and so we have here um, seven seals on this thing. And so it's going to take a lot for this to, to open up. Now, again, we have a number here, seven. Um, and we do have seven individual scrolls described, but maybe seven should be kind of a, um, a, a tip off to us that there is a, a holistic picture here of something that maybe these should, they do have individual significance, but we can't forget that this is one overall complete or total scene. Um, I'll, additionally, we're gonna have seven trumpets. We're gonna have seven bowls of wrath. And that's not an accident that we have seven, seven, and seven. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the structure of the book next week, because we're certainly not going to have time this week. Um, so is there a significance there being seven seals? So we talked about that. It's completely and totally sealed up. It's fully sealed up. No one can get in. Um, that was a common for important legal documents in Rome. So this isn't like an unnatural thing or an unheard of thing. So that's just a, a brief picture of the scroll. Um, Here's what's really significant and why it pays to, to study your Bible. Because um, if you're just coming into this cold and you see this seal, and the sealed up scroll, you can probably piece together, you know, this is something important. Um, but we get an idea of exactly what this is when we read through some of these other passages. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 through chapter 3, verse 3. Um, God gives Ezekiel a double-sided scroll filled with words of lament and mourning and woe. Um, so we got a double-sided scroll, just like here in Revelation, so very similar image. Um, what do you think is written on that Ezekiel scroll if there are words of lament and mourning and woe? Punishment, cursing. What, what was Ezekiel's job? You remember? Yeah. 
God gave him a lot of weird jobs, but overall, Ezekiel was a prophet to um, prophet. to Israel. Um, I believe it's Israel or Judah. I don't recall. Now that I say that, I'm second guessing. He was a prophet to one of the kingdoms, uh, and basically, his job was to warn them of coming judgment. Um, God was going to send a foreign army to judge his people, and Ezekiel's job, again and again, through these unusual displays, was to provide warning that judgment was coming. So here at the outset of his ministry, here's a scroll filled with words of lament and mourning and woe. It's, it's a symbol of judgment. Uh, we also, in Daniel, we have a scroll that shows up. Uh, it's chapter 12, verse 1, towards the end of the book. Daniel uh, is shown a scroll sealed up until the time of the end, uh, by which time many will be purified and made spotless and refined. Um, that, that sounds like good news. Um, however, how does one, often in, in scripture, in scriptural context, how is one purified or made spotless? Fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are saved through the blood of Jesus and refined oftentimes through hardship and difficulty. That, that process of um, being made holy can, sanctification can cannot be pleasant all the time. Um, kind of pure joy, my brothers, when you endure hardships of all kinds. You know, so while there's good news, it's not necessarily saying it's good news that comes easily. So what we have in Revelation is a scroll, very much in the same vein as Ezekiel and Daniel. Um, maybe even the same scroll is what James or what John is is recalling as he sees this image. It seems to be this predestined plan of God for history. Um, I forgot to mention a note in Daniel in particular. It's significant to note that God's plan for redemption and judgment at the end of history is is written on this scroll. That seems to be what's implied. And Daniel even asks at the end of the book um, what all this means. And he is told, quote, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So the last words of Daniel are basically, don't worry about it. You're going to die before any of this happens anyway. Uh, and the reader in Daniel is left on a cliffhanger. We never know what's written on that scroll, you know, with, with God's divine plan of judgment, restoration, and so on. So now in Revelation, we have this scroll, kind of Daniel part two in some ways, this double-sided scroll that has messages of judgment and redemption and, and God's plan for history, apparently. And so here is, is basically what we're looking at, most likely, if, if we're reading our literary clues the right way. You make, does that make sense? You follow me there? Okay. So this is a big deal. It outlines uh, the inheritance for the faithful. Um, it outlines the events of past, present, future history. Uh, it outlines the judgments that befall the wicked. Um, th this, is, this is everything. This is God's whole total plan right here. And no one is found worthy to reveal the mystery of God's plan. Everything that God wants to do, plans to do, is sealed up, and, and we can't read it. We can't know what it says. And this, this scroll cannot be enacted until somebody reads it aloud. And it leads John just to this point of weeping, as it probably would us too. I mean, this is, you're, you're pastoring these seven churches of people that are trying to overcome difficulties of various kinds and trying to overcome hardships and trying to live faithfully in this world. And there is this great thing that's waiting for them, but it can never be, it can never be realized until somebody is found to read this. And despite searching through everyone in heaven and everyone on earth and everyone under the earth, nobody's found. It's a tragedy. Um, we're going to skip this part uh, really for time's sake. Um, and we've already kind of touched on this in several instances, God's plan of, uh, and suffering. Suffering can be a good thing. It can be a purifying thing. James 1, 2, we've read. Uh, Hebrews 12, uh, God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained in it. Um, you know, it's the same way that we discipline children. In fact, this morning, uh, Levi and I were playing Legos and he was not being good at sharing and, you know, he was just being really grabby. And so I said, Levi, you need, just don't, don't grab things that don't belong to you or that other people are using. And he got angry and he shouted. And so I said, sit on your bed. And so he had to sit on his bed for like two minutes. 
And then when he got done, he went to Lindsay and said, dad's being mean, you know? And so I had to tell him, buddy, the only reason that you get in trouble is because you break rules. And I'm trying to teach you not to break rules. I'm trying to teach you to be nice to people. Discipline's not fun. It's not pleasant. But ultimately, fingers crossed, it produces a harvest of righteousness and the ones who undergo it. Um, First Peter 1 6, there's another um, just reminder that you know hardship is it, it's hard, but it can produce something worthwhile. So, you know, suffering, scripture teaches that suffering while hard changes us, it forms us for godly purposes uh, in a way that pleasantry just just can't, you know. So we come with that. So this this plan of judgment and difficulty and hardship, um, you know, ultimate judgment is pretty final. But judgment in the meantime that we experience can have this refining purpose. One of the elders said to me, meaning John, "Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals." Amen. Now, just want to point something out. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Remember that. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been <laughs> slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The lion of Judah. Um, as John weeps over this unopened scroll, he's uh, comforted by the announcement that one of all the people, one is worthy. Um, and, and when he's told that he sees uh, he's the Lion of Judah, we'll just talk there. He's the Lion of Judah or, or the Root of David. Who is that? Obviously, we know it's Jesus. That's a dead giveaway. Jesus is called by both of those things and other places. Tribe of Judah, Lion of David. How has he triumphed? You know, this lion is the symbol of power, the sign. Uh, it's, it's a regal symbol. Um, how has Jesus triumphed? This is a, he, he has triumphed, and that's why he's worthy. Conquered death. What's that? Do you say he conquered he's death? He's oh, let me hear me. I thought my mic was off. Oh, my God. Your camera's off. Yeah, it, if that's what you said, that's correct. He, he conquers death. Um, and, and along with that, he, he's innocent of sin. He's raised from the dead. He's victorious over the grave. He is a conqueror in that way. He is a lion in his victory over the grave. Um, and this image of a lion it invokes power and might and strength and regality and so on. What's interesting is that when John turns around, he's, it's this announcement, the lion, behold, he's victorious, he overcomes, and John turns, what does he see? A lamb. A lamb. Now, what kind of, what kind of imagery does a lamb invoke? I'm getting ahead of myself again. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Passive. Yeah, somewhat of a, a timid creature, right? Weak. Weak, innocent. Yeah, there's a, a strong juxtaposition of imagery here. We have one who is announced to be this victorious, regal, powerful conqueror. And John turns and he sees this humble, weak, peaceful little lamb. And they are one and the same. Um, but it's, it's this imagery is just really, it's very striking and beautiful. So the lamb that John sees is slaughtered. Um, looks as though it's been, been killed. What, what major Bible story utilizes a slaughtered lamb as its focal point? Kind of the forerunner for why they sacrifice lambs on an altar later on in Israel's history. Abraham offering Isaac on the altar. Well, Abraham and Isaac, there's an even earlier reference to a lamb, you know, one that was provided by God. Um, right. A ram. So, so that Abraham's own son wouldn't be sacrificed. So there's an even earlier forerunner. Um, the image that I was thinking of is, is the Passover lamb or the Paschal lamb. 
You know, it's by the blood of the lamb that marked the Israelites and their, their doorposts that saved them from the angel of death. That slaughtered lamb was the key to salvation. And I guess that was the case in, in um, Abraham and Isaac as well. So let's, let's take all this imagery then, you know, as this question, how does the image apply to Jesus? Well, it's his blood that marks the people of God and saves them from death. So let's take all this imagery, this powerful conquering lion, this humble, meek lamb and his blood. What is, how does all this tie together? What does, what does Jesus as a lamb have to do with him being a lion? How can he be called both, I guess, at the same time? Well, it, since it's just imagery, it's representations of those things. He isn't actually a lamb or actually a lion. The qualities of both, though. Yes. This is really yes. What I'm asking. How can he possess and demonstrate the qualities of both of these images at the same time? It's not saying that on the one hand, he's kind of like a lion sometimes, and on the other hand, he's kind of like a lamb other times. He is, at the same time, simultaneously, this powerful conquering lion and this humble slaughtered lamb. Jordan? Yes. Sometimes I think it's like a parent. A parent um, disciplines their child, but, in the, but they still love their child. Mm. He, he's mm -hmm. sweet. Yeah, there, you can and have... the lamb can represent innocence. Mm. It's specifically, what's said of the lamb is that it looks as if it has been slain. That's a key detail. So he's not just a lamb, I guess we should say. He is this powerful lion at the same time, a slaughtered lamb. He's God and Jesus, part of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Definitely a dual nature there. This might be saying something about Jesus's power and the kind of conquest um, that he employs and the kind of power that he employs. Um, if you think back in the days of ancient Rome, you're living under the empire. Um, Caesar was God on earth, basically, and in, in the minds of the people. And his power was displayed in his conquest, how the empire would spread, how he would subjugate nations, how um, uprisings would be squashed. You would have the legions of soldiers marching in formation. Um, power was might. But here we have Jesus who demonstrates conquest over death and who puts his might on display, not through, not through squashing or displays of machismo, for lack of a better word, but rather his power is put on display and his conquest is put on display through his sacrifice and through his humble offering of himself, I guess. I mean, and in I that way, this what's is that? also it's also kind of a precursor to his his form of judgment. He's he'll, he will, he will judge all of us as through through his humility and his his power. Mm -hmm. it, it will be a, it will be both. Um, so, I mean, to me, it, this describes his complete his completeness. I suppose that could be. I'm sorry? I suppose that could be. I'm, I'm trying to kind of just what, what that, how that fits, I guess. Kind of a, in my mind, it's a, it's a, it's a precursor to his, his character. What, what we will expect come the time, come, come judgment day. Okay. His humility, but yet, he has all the power to. Okay, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's a potential here. Um, in in the, it is the description of his attributes. Yeah. Well, in, Always. Yeah, and in, in, in maybe that's that's the first level we should get to is we're just we're just describing who Jesus is and what he's done here. You know, he through his sacrifice, through his humble offering of himself, he overcomes grave and he has victory through that. 
If we want to move to maybe even a, a deeper application here, we have kind of a statement of, of power and how it just looks different in God's kingdom than it would in the world that these ancient people were living in. Um, you know, you might, okay, we're living in Philadelphia or we're living in Smyrna. Somebody got killed because of our faith. Somebody like literally was taken out back and killed because of Jesus. That might look like God is weak and that might look like power means authority to put somebody to death. But what we have here in this display is this sign that God is not weak. That actually his victory comes through his humility. It is an ultimate victory. It will be established, maybe as Rob's saying, at the end here. But it's also one that says, okay, power just looks different. The ability to take somebody back out, out back and stone him to death is not real power. The ability to live righteously and be raised up at the last day and overcome death, that's power. And it doesn't come through might and through flexing and squishing. It comes through this, this humility and this meekness before God. Um, and that might be the more applicable thing probably to us or to them as people as we try to live this out and wrestle with the question of what does it mean to have an exercise power in this world and how do I as a person of faith do that differently than what I see in this world system that makes sense ish I, I, I can ramble sometimes so let me know if I am <laughs> Well, right. on the one hand, you have Jesus, the lamb, who mm -hmm. was slain. And on the other hand, you have Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, and he's a lion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, so, whoa, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, same time. You know, it's, it's not like sometimes he's this and sometimes he's this. He is both simultaneously. That's his nature. Um, you know, he is the lion. He is that that yeah. ruling power because he was the slaughtered lamb and to be a slaughtered lamb is to demonstrate the power and regality of this conquering lion at the same time it's just a different view of power and authority in god's uh, economy all right so some other qualities about this lamb um he has seven horns so right away this is a weird looking lamb um he's got seven eyes um again we, sevens showing up here Horns were kind of this symbol of power. Um, and you might, it's probably easier to think, you know, if we were in the ancient world and we had to plow a field, we'd hitch up our plows to some oxen. Um, and those horns that oxen are just, you know, they're always there. That was just this symbol of strength. Um, same is true in, uh, in Daniel and some of his visions. He has a picture of a beast with many horns on it. And there's a little horn growing out of one of them. And, you know, so we have this picture, maybe complete power in this lamb. Um, and I believe it also says he has seven eyes. Um, he's this all-seeing, uh, sees, sees everything. There's complete vision, complete understanding. So he is this sacrificial lamb that holds all power, that holds all, all sight and all understanding, and, and at the same time is this conquering, you know, regal, ruling symbol of power and authority. You're, just, you're getting a lot of images. They're just kind of put in the blender and swirled around together to give us kind of this reaction to Jesus that is awe-inspiring and at the same time humble, I guess. Oops, I need to stop hitting that button, apparently. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, and then the seven spirits of God uh, sent into all the earth. Again, the, the full spirit of God dwells within him. If we, if, if that inspiration for that is Isaiah um, 2, you said, or Isaiah 11, 2, um, then, you know, all those qualities and attributes that we, we associate with the Holy Spirit fully present within the Lamb. Um, so clear as mud, right? Verse 7, he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are pr uh, prayers of the saints. So we have, here's an interesting picture. And it's probably not surprising to us, um, but it would be very shocking uh, from an Old Testament perspective. Because always in these heavenly visions, there's one sitting on the throne. And where is uh, the lamb whenever John turns around? He's, he's approaching the throne of God. Were, were the 24 elders allowed to approach the throne? 
there's a sea. We don't know if it's like an ocean of sea or if it's a list. There's, but there's this distance. There's this separation between the throne and the elders. And yet here's this lamb that can just kind of waltz right up. What might that tell us about this lamb? Who can, that's, his, that's his throne too. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I was going to say, who's allowed to just kind of waltz into the Oval Office here today? Um, not just anybody can just walk yes, right up yes. to the throne. This is a statement about Jesus. He has direct access to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there, this is a, again, I don't know why people say Jesus never claimed he was God. He alludes to it a lot, and then, like, all the people that knew him the best continually have you know, elude and just flat out say he's God. Um, here's, here's another one. Uh, it's just a, it's a statement of his divinity. So he takes this scroll of God's divine plan um, and he's greeted by the worship of 24 elders. Again, some representation, some symbolism of God's people here. And this is what's really interesting. They're holding all these prayers in these bowls. Um, they're holding on to them. Uh, it's, they're going to get poured out a little later, um, but maybe there, there, there's a simple kind of interesting picture here of, you know, we pray to God, and a lot of times, you know, Old Testament imagery is probably most helpful here, that you would burn incense, and that incense was kind of the symbolic um, sacrifice of prayer to God, and it would go up to God, and sometimes prayer is even described as incense that fills the nostrils of God, and so we imagine our, our, our prayers is going up to God directly and then yes, no, and moving on. But what if, and this is just kind of an interesting question, what if some prayers are God just kind of holds on to? And the answer isn't yes or no, but maybe the answer is just not yet. And we're just going to put this, we're just going to put this prayer in this bowl and we're going to wait until there's a right time to address that. And I think that's an interesting way to think about prayer. You know, it's, it's not just this question that immediately gets answered or dismissed, but maybe God holds on to it. I don't know. That did, To me, that just kind of means something. You know, if, and if they're holding these bowls of prayer, apparently that's symbolically what's happening here, I think. Again, I got to quit touching this button. There you go. <laughs> so as, as, I, as that idea gets thrown out there, how does that hit you? Maybe this is our devotional moment of the day. I think it's all in God's timing. Um, you know, we, we pray a lot that Jesus would come quickly. We don't know when he's going to come. I wonder if those prayers aren't being held until actually the time that God has for him to come back. certainly not going to be answered until that point and it it doesn't it doesn't say they've been answered or not answered it just shows me god holds our prayers precious he they're they're never just tossed by the wayside they are always before the throne well, prayers are healing we're going to talk about that on Sunday. We're, well, we're not really going to talk about it. We're going to mention it as the situation that we're, we're talking about James 5. Uh, elders pray for people, anoint them with oil, and the prayer given in faith will make the sick person well. Um, sometimes we pray and pray, the person doesn't get well. Um, what, if, what if the answer isn't no? What if the answer is just not yet? You know, there will come a day when, when lo, the lame walk and the blind see and, and the deaf hear and, you know, the, those riddled with cancer no longer will be. And there, there will be healing. It just might not be now. You know, what if, this is kind of just the, the example I think of, is what if God just kind of holding on to that prayer until the end when he says, okay, and just pours it out. You know, in fact, and I was trying to find it. I don't remember. I think it's one of the seven bowls. Uh, maybe it's the censure of ash. There's a, there's a reference here to the bowls of the prayers of the saints, not just being held, but being poured out. 
That's probably a chapter to each. Isn't it true in all our lives that sometimes prayers are answered immediately and sometimes not at all, and sometimes at just the right time? And like Roger was saying, he, he holds them, he hears them, but it's in his timing that he answers them for our own good. I definitely think we're the ones that benefit when he does this. It's not that God's just like, I'll get to it when I get to it. But, you know, there's it, the passage I was looking for was chapter eight. There's this image of this golden censer. Uh, it says, he stood at the altar and he was given much incense. Incense is always associated with prayer. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hands. And then the angel took the censer with the prayer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes, lightning, and earthquake. Sometimes our, our, our prayers and our appeals are for justice. Um, sometimes our prayers are for wrong things to be set right. Um, and sometimes God answers now, but sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes those prayers of, of judgment, those imprecatory prayers for destruction of evil, um, those prayers will be answered someday. You know, the answer is not, not now, but in the end, um, I don't know, I, I read this image and I just think it's interesting. We have these bowls of prayer that the elders are holding on to. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's not that God answered them and like put them aside for a keepsake or just said, no, it's just, okay, we're just, they're just holding on. They're waiting for this moment. And I just think that that's not a small thing to overlook for us. And maybe even to these seven churches and these people that are suffering, these people that are you know, being threatened with, with economic scarcity, um, the Thyatira, or you know, these people that have heard the judgments, of the, the coming judgments of Jesus and, and are told to wake up. And how do we do that, Lord? And, you know, there are these prayers that God takes and receives and just says, just, I'm just not going to do it right now, but there's a time. Um, to me, I find that comforting and interesting. Probably have to think on that more. All right, we're running out of time, so I'm going to keep moving. So the song uh, that they sing in chapter 5, verse 9 says, And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. So again, the sacrifice is what makes him worthy. It's what makes him um, the, the conquering lion. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. The song's not done yet. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. So we have this kind of rippling song that just sort of erupts uh, when the lamb approaches the throne. Uh, it starts with the 24 elders and the four living creatures. So if you, if you mid go back, I wish I would have put a picture here. If you go back and you remember that picture of the throne room, we've got God in the center, and then we've got four living creatures, and then we've got the 24 elders, and so we're kind of moving outward from this focal point. And then surrounding that throne room scene, even further out, we've got this myriad of angels in heaven, and so, and then after that, we have this praise that moves out even further to all creation above and on and below the earth. So, it's, it's this act of Jesus taking this scroll of being able to finally enact God's eternal and predestined plan. And by predestined, by the way, I don't mean in a weird, like Calvinistic way, just that in God's foreknowledge, this is what I intend to do. Jesus takes that scroll and is the only one that can open it. And so now God's plan for judgment and restoration and healing and justice can actually unfold. And it just causes praise to erupt outward and ripple out like this shockwave of worship. Amen. Amen.
I didn't say it, John did. <laughs> the highlights from this song, uh, he purchased men, uh, you, or you purchased men with your blood for God. Um, men there obviously is gender inclusive. It's just you purchase people through your blood for God, which is an interesting thing. Because um, everybody is God's creation, and yet they've been, been purchased. They've been almost like servants brought into a household. Um, we've been given a new name and a new family and a new master. We've been brought in through blood. We've made them to be kingdom, a kingdom of priests. So we were outcasts, and now we've been purchased like servants, but we've also been made into priests. And our job as a priest, as every priest, is to show God to the people and bring the people before God, intercessory work. That's what priests do. And they will reign on earth. So here's an encouraging message for those who've been thrown out of the synagogue in Philadelphia and those who are economically on the ropes, perhaps, in Thyatira. You will reign on earth. Um, here's a promise. Uh, to the one on the throne and to the Lamb. So previously we had, you know, God was and is and is to come, glory, praise, honor to the one on the throne. But now these same divine praises and these same divine um, proclamations, and I think that's not the right word, but these attributes that are ascribed to God are now ascribed to both God and to the Lamb. Um, so that's a significant shift here as well. We have now this, this divine praise going to Jesus, which isn't a surprise. He is fully divine, and that's symbolized by him approaching the throne. He's fully authoritative in that he's the only one that can open the scrolls, and he's fully deserving of worship in the fact that he is now part of the focal point of this you know, praise of all creation. Um, and that's where this chapter ends, is just with this worship of Jesus and who he is, which is supposed to be an encouragement and a reminder to these seven churches and their struggles and in their obstinance, but also to us in our struggles and in our obstinance of who Jesus is and what he's worth and what's really happening in the heavenly throne room, despite what may maybe things look like on the global stage. Um, next week, I'll, I'll pause there. Questions before we move on with our, our wrap up. That was a beautiful comment by Jay that he typed in. Oh, I, mean, I saw my screen flash, but I didn't get a chance to really say. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's what's pictured here. This rippling praise just moves outward in these... Is concentric circles the right word? I don't know. Yeah. All right. So um, this is kind of as, as great and as moving and beautiful as these two chapters are, really, they're just kind of stage setting chapters. And we're really going to get into the, the heavenly action of what happens in the book of Revelation next week. Um, we're going to move into chapters. Um, six and seven we're going to start to look at the scroll and the seven seals as they're opened and what happens and what does that mean and what does it probably not mean and um approaching with humility but at the same time based off of literary illusions and kind of the literary nature of the book we can we can go i, I think a long ways in determining what john is trying to say here um we're also going to talk about the structure of the book like i said we'll have a brief excursus on that and how, um, really how the book repeats itself a lot using different words. Um, if you're looking for some homework this week, a good exercise is to read the section on the seven um, scroll or the seven seals, and then read the section on the seven trumpets and then the seven bowls, and maybe just make some comparisons like in a, a spreadsheet or something of um, the similarities between those sections of seven. Um, and you can almost, you know, the first seal, first trumpet, first bowl, what are, what are the similarities and so forth? Um, because next week we're going to talk about something called recapitulation, um, which is this idea of repeating itself, kind of circling back on top of itself and intensifying as we go. Um, and that's kind of how Revelation appears to have been written um, and how John kind of writes in 1 John too. Um, so we'll talk about that next week though. Um, 
I miss our fellowship too, Jay says in the chat. Um, this is better than nothing. Um, in case you're, you're not aware, um, Governor Pritzker did um, extend our um, stay at home order through the end of May. Um, so we that, that's expected. I don't think that really caught anybody by surprise, uh, but that is the official word. Also, um, just for your information, starting May, in case you're not aware, if you leave your home and go into public, you are supposed to wear a mask. Um, so if you, um, I don't have any. If you need a mask, I can put the word out. Um, or if you check Pinterest, you can make one out of like some sweatpants or something, I'm sure. <laughs> but that is is just you know for your information uh, with that said let's pray uh, and we'll wrap up today god we thank you for this picture of um, your authority and your grandeur we thank you for this reminder of jesus uh, and who he is and what he's done and i pray that as we um, walk away from our study and our time today that maybe we would chew on and just roll around some of the things we've spoken about. Um, I pray that we would be encouraged. Um, I know in our world, certainly there are a number of people that need encouragement. Um, some just because we're stuck at home, some because you know, they're laid off and money's getting tight. Um, some because they've got their own personal battles that they're going through. And so I pray that as we we just try to overcome the difficulties of life, Father, that you would remind us of your throne room, of the praise uh, that is happening, of the song of, of celebration that we still get to be a part of because of what is soon to take place. I pray that as we wrestle with power in our lives and influence and what does it mean to have power, to wield power, and to use authority, I pray that you would help us to see um, the downfall of might makes right and traditional understandings of power and that you would help us to see the wisdom of humility and selflessness and sacrifice, the foolishness of the cross. Uh, I pray that that would be our wisdom. And I pray that as we lift up our prayers to you, um, these prayers that sometimes come in desperation and sometimes come in times of hardship and sometimes are accompanied by tears. Pray that we be reminded that you hold them all, um, that you don't dismiss and that you don't turn a deaf ear, but that you, you collect and that you answer in time in your wisdom. And we pray, Father, just for the trust to acknowledge that and continue in our faithfulness, despite what may happen immediately or may not happen. We lift up all of these things to you, knowing that you're good, and knowing that what will soon take place will take place. So help us to overcome and be faithful in the meantime. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. My pleasure. I hope everybody has a great week. Um, let me close this real quick. Stop that. And stop recording.